and there we go. Okay guys, we're waiting for everything to catch up, so Facebook and YouTube, as soon as we see that we're online, we're actually going to start with Digital Classroom. So I'm very much looking forward to it, but we found out that YouTube sometimes cuts off the first 20 seconds, so that's why we're now waiting until we see that we're live. And in a week, are we live on Facebook? Not yet. Okay, not yet. So we're waiting for Facebook. Okay, I see that YouTube is catching up at the moment, so we're live on YouTube and we're live on Facebook. Now, the reason we start without a trailer is that we actually found out that YouTube or Facebook is cutting off the first 20 seconds, and we know you guys want to see it back, and sometimes we just felt midi into a story, and that was weird, because in 20 seconds I can tell a lot of stuff to you guys, you know that, right? So, that's why we waited. So, we're going to start the trailer, and then we're ready for Digital Classroom, so here we go. you guys are back with me. Hey, how are you? Welcome to Digital Classroom. Now let me first explain to you guys what Digital Classroom is and what we're going to do in 2017 because the first thing of course, Happy New Year because we can still do that because it's only the 11th and I heard that until the night of the 11th you can say Happy New Year. So Happy New Year and I hope that all your inspirations will come true or all your wishes of course and you have a very inspirational 2017. Now what are we going to do? We have a great model today, stylist, all-round cool person, and she's a little bit of nuts sometimes. And her name? Nadine. You asked for it, you're gonna get it. So we also hooked up some extra audio, so we're actually gonna ask Nadine some questions and you guys can interact, because that's the cool thing about Digital Classroom, you guys can interact with us. And that's very cool, because normally you can only do that during a workshop, so that's interesting. Okay, so let me see, we have everything set up, now what we're going to do today is actually we're going to experiment a little bit differently than from previous digital classrooms. Now with previous digital classrooms what we always did is was li like a sort of workshop. But we've done 12 or 14 and to be totally honest we don't want to do the same thing over and over again because then you see the same stuff over and over again and that's, well, that can be a little bit boring. So we decided let's do the new series more aimed on photo shoots. So I'm actually going to work for my own portfolio and I'm going to shoot some images for that. And you will see a big difference. Normally with a digital classroom and with a workshop, if I do a beginner's workshop, I will actually just explain the lighting, I do two or three shots and that's it. When I do my portfolio, I will shoot completely different because now I want to have that perfect shot. And the perfect shot is of course impossible, but as close as possible to perfect. So you're going to see us doing that. In between, we have a chat open for Facebook and we have a chat open for YouTube. So you can ask whatever you want and of course you can later watch this back. Okay, I think that's about it. Nadine, are you ready? Nadine is ready, she's knocking her head like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready, let's go Frank, I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to switch over to our cameras on Nadine. And now you can already see what she's doing. Oh my, Nadine. I love red and I love fairy tales. Hmm, absolutely awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna switch places with Steffi and Anoui who are behind the cameras. And I'm gonna go to my spot and I'm gonna show you my spot very quickly. That's there, but there's nobody there yet. So let's keep the magic in and let's focus on Nadine because in a moment I will be there, but I'm not there yet. Okay, the other thing what you're going to see today is you're going to see the images coming in on my computer, as you can see here. So in a moment when we do the photo shoot, we'll actually make Nadine smaller and me, and you can see the images coming in on Capture One. That's the software we're using. But for now, let's first go here and let's explain some stuff to you guys. So Nadine, uh, sorry, Annabeek and Steffi, are you ready to take over for me? Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to go to my spot. Okay, let's see if I don't drop any cables. There we are. <laughs> okay. There we go. Hello. So, I'm here. Great. This is my spot. This is where I can teach you guys stuff and where we can interact. Now, what I see 
you can't see that now, but I have a big monitor over there. Now, the most important thing for me when I'm in the studio, I want to shoot tethered. Now, tethered means I have a cable connected to my camera that will actually go into Capture One. Now, why is that important? One, our model can see the images coming in. Now, normally my computer is all the way over there and she can't see. So what do you get? You get models going like, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see. And it doesn't work. That will really take the, the mood out of your shots. So we have the big monitor over there. So I can see that, the model can see it. The other thing is normally in a studio, and that's very important, you have to make it dark, as dark as possible. Now why is that? Very simple. If you have the dark, uh, sorry, if you have the studio dark, you can actually see what your lighting are doing. At the moment we have two let go panels, and those are incredibly bright, but they make sure that, well, I look good for you guys. That's what lighting does. Now we have a very flat, we have them actually aimed at the ceiling to create a bigger light source. And that's how light works, right? If you have a bigger light source, you have softer quality of light. But normally we love to have them off. So normally our studio is really dark. And then I can see what my lighting is doing. So now I have to guesstimate it a little bit. The first light source we're going to use is a one meter Allengrom Deep Octa with a light tools grid. <laughs> now let me first explain to you why a Deep Octa. The deep octa is, it has like a trough, and that means that the light will actually be steered way better. Now normally a softbox will actually just throw the light away. And this one will actually steer the light, but it's still soft. Why the grid in front? Because we want to aim that light. I love to aim my lighting. A lot of photographers will use big softboxes, and to be honest, it's not my thing. I like to be able to really pinpoint the light on my model, so to create some of a vignette. Of course, you can do that later in Photoshop, but again, that's not my thing. Now, we have everything set up, and Nadine is looking awesome and stunning and great. Always make sure that your model is at ease. Stunning, great. Mrs. Nadine, awesome. Don't, don't overdo it. <laughs> and what I now want to do is I want to make sure that my lighting on my model is right. Now, I'm going to move the light as close as possible to my model. That will mean that my light source on the model will be actually like this. So very, very tight. As soon as I think, well, you know, I want to see a little bit more, I will actually move back. Do we have a problem with the live broadcast, Annemiek? Well, you have your cord hanging out. Oh, I have my cord hanging out of my... Oh, no, that's no problem at all. I, I'm always nervous when people around me go like, ooh, you have something weird. Oh, you're closing it. Awesome. Yeah. It's better than that I'm not wearing pants at all. You can better have a cord hanging out and no pants at all in a week. Although some people might, uh, no, I don't even go there. Okay, so the, mo the, the closer I move my light, the smaller that spot will be. Now, if I move my light further away, that spot will be bigger. So what I'm going to do is, because I love close lighting, so I'm actually going to move this light very, very close to my model. And I'm going to do it under a slight angle. And just aim it like this. Maybe a little bit more down. So let's do that. There we go. But now I still don't know what the output of my lighting is, right? So I have to meter. And this is very important. A lot of people nowadays don't use light meters anymore. And in my opinion, it's the most important thing. Because if you use a light meter, there's no guessing anymore. Every shot will be right. So let's pick up the light meter very quickly. And light meter is very simple. You turn it on. And that's about it. You only have to turn it on. Okay, move the light a little bit towards my model. Take the meter reading, 11.2. That means I'm two tenths of an f-stop from f11. Keep the camera on me. <laughs> so I'm two tenths of an f-stop of f11. So I'm gonna do two clicks down, one, two. Now don't try this at home, I have a remote control in my light meter. And let's pick up the camera and take the first test shot. Okay, oops, there we go. Oh, and by the way, if you were wondering why I'm wearing this, yeah, we have an expression in the Netherlands called door schade en schande, which translates back in through shame and cost, you learn. And that's actually what happened to me a while ago. Now, we use tether tool stuff, and this is actually the jerk stopper from Sony itself. What happens is if you yank your ca cable, you will damage the port. And the port is about 600 euro repair. 
But even worse, you lose your camera for five or six weeks for repair. Now, if you have a jerk stopper like this, and you stand on your cable, what will happen is there is no tension on the cable, so you won't damage the port. But what can also happen is because the stuff is so tight, you'll actually drop the camera. And that happened to me about two or three weeks ago. So there was an A7R2, and I totally destroyed it. So now actually using this, because now if it happens, it will actually hang on my hand, and I hope that I have enough reaction time to actually grab my camera. Now some people will go like, okay, but should I use the tether tools jerk stopper because I can drop my camera? Let me put it this way. The jerk stopper saved my camera at least maybe a thousand times and one time it went wrong. So all those thousand times it's saved and now it will never happen again. Okay, Nadine, are you ready? I talk way too much, right? Okay. Okay, you girls can uh, switch to capture one and me in the small uh, part. There we go. Okay, first test shot. And one of the other things you always have to do is make first a black shot and just tell people that was intended that way. I have to turn on my skyport, otherwise, otherwise it won't work. Okay, there we go. That will work way better. Okay, very nice. Now, of course, when you see the image coming in, you see something completely different from what you saw with all the lighting on in the studio. And that's the cool thing. Because if you look in the studio, you see the let go panels and you see all flat lighting. Now, as soon as I take the shot, you can actually see that we do something completely different. And I actually already like this shot. I think we're done. Don't you agree? Yeah, it's an awesome shot, Nadine. It's, it's perfect. We don't need to do anything more. So thank you so very much. Thank you so very much for watching. This was Digital Classroom. I'm just kidding with you guys. The cool thing is, due to that light meter, the first shot I take is actually already properly lit. Everything looks great. But this is not all. We talk about styling, we talk about the model, and a lot of people will go like, okay, if a beautiful girl in front of the camera, that's enough. And for me, that isn't enough. That's why I start my book. If you photograph a beautiful girl in jeans and tank top, you better be a lighting wizard because nothing else is going on. Now here we have this beautiful set, which Nadine did absolutely awesome. We have this beautiful dress. Everything is beautiful. It's so easy to just take a shot and say, okay, we're done. Great. The difference between a great shot and a perfect shot is actually only this. So first you have to do all this work. And then to make it perfect, you have to do that very, very little part. And that's all in expression, posing. So we're going to do that now with Nadine. Can you look a little bit more up towards the light? A very nice eyes towards me. Awesome. Okay, play a little bit with your expressions. There we go. That's nice. And you hear me talking to the model almost constantly. I'm constantly coaching my model. I'm telling her she's doing fine. Even if she isn't, I will still tell her, awesome, great. Of course, Nadine is, but... You know what I mean, right? Don't ever tell a model, nah, I don't like that shot, because you will really take out the mood of the shot. Also, another thing which you see me doing in the later shots is I'm actually including her feet. Now, in the first shots, I didn't include her feet, and I want to experiment with that, because I like the light fall off under there, and I think she's misunderstanding something. For all you English guys watching, I'm so very sorry, but in the Dutch world, this is how we drink tea. I missed the pinky, Nadine. Yes. You see how she's doing that on the top part and not on the cup? So she's actually holding her, her saucer like that. That's awesome, Nadine. Really like this. Very nice. And with Nadine, you don't have to really coach, but I still do it. And you know why? Because it will get that nice interaction with your model. That's awesome. That's nice. Love it. So even if you don't have to coach your model, just do it. It will work so much nicer and it will work so much better. Don't break my stuff. Okay, she's trying the flying saucer now. Very nice. Awesome. And also try some close-ups. You don't have to include the whole set all the time. That's nice. And try some really wide-angle shots. There we go. And this is the cool thing, because I'm using that really aimed lighting, I can actually change the way that the whole scene looks. It's nice that light fall off. It's almost like a painting. 
The thing that you have to be very careful for is the shadows on her face. Now, if she will be looking, let's say, that way, she will have a lot of shadow on that side. So I'm actually making her look a little bit more towards the light source. There we go. Nice, a little bit. Yes, there we go. Really nice. Make sure that her feet are in the shot. Cool. Love it. Now, the thing that I'm missing, Nadine, do you agree? We have to have a dog on that chair, don't you think so? Yeah. If you want. I think we do. And a week. Can I have... Uh, woof woof. Can I have our dog? The dog no, not his head only. Don't destroy my dog. <laughs> Give me the total dog. Not Tweety, but the dog. Not the bunny or the bear, but the dog. Oh, we have all this kind of stuff over here. Don't, don't even go there. It's ridiculous, the stuff that we have in our studio. On the chair. And I'm just experimenting with it. I don't know if it's Nadine's idea. Do you like it? I like it, but uh, I placed the king there uh, because of a story I uh, read last, uh, last week. Of the lost king. Okay, why she became the Queen of Hearts. Your audio is still off, so they, let me do that after the retouching. We're going to tell about the story we have. Okay, let's see if we have the dog in now. Dog will be in the very, very dark area, just creeping in. There we go. Really like this. And if you don't like it, we can always cut it off. Who spreekt die dan? That's Dutch. We always tell that to our dogs. Really nice. Cool. Second okay. Um, yes? Yeah, they're now coming in, but it took a while. Oh, okay. No problem. A There's a little bit of delay. That's correct. Really nice. And as you can see, we're shooting way more than we normally do because I want all these expressions. Now, in the end, I will only choose one image. Because you don't... I will choose one with the dog and one without, by the way. Because you don't want six or seven images totally the same. That's, that's boring. Okay, anyway, can we turn on the blue gel in the back? Let me just see what it does. Oh, that's a nice pose. Love it. It gives it a little bit more of a pin-up style look. Nice. Great. Okay, so we also have a blue gel in the back. And we're going to turn that one on at the moment. If Afra doesn't break her neck. In between. There we go. Maybe you can do a question in between. Oh yeah, I can always do a question in between. Johan is asking, uh, Frank, ever considered using a black rabbit strap in your studio? Isn't that a safe option? The black rabbit strap in the studio should be a safe option. The only problem with the black rabbit strap is I always have it on my neck. So I don't want it on my neck. I, I prefer this. But I also have the black rabbit strap. Really like that. So great, great straps. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to refresh our skyport to make sure that we have all our strobes in because we now have an extra strobe in the back. Now, I always meter stuff. I'm Mr. Light Meter. And this I won't meter. And I will tell you why. For me, the backlighting is something like a little bit of a, how do you call that? Atmospheric light. It's like cooking. I don't want it too bright or too dark. Or maybe I want it very bright. I don't know. What I'm going to do is, because I know the background will be a little bit less light, I will actually turn the background all the way up. So I'm going to go select my DRX, do it on full power. And because I know the front will actually be too bright, so I have to lower that, I will actually go to my front. And this is the cool thing, I metered, right? And I metered on F11. So if I go to my front and I will actually go from, it's now on 5.3, I will go to 2.3. Oh, let me go to 3.3. From 5.3 to 3.3, that's exactly two stops. So that means if I'm now on F11, I actually can turn down to F8 and to 5.6. And now the background, the backlighting will be very bright and the front will be a little bit less bright than before. But it will still be correctly lit on my model because I lowered it two steps and I also opened up the camera two steps. What you can see now is that you get a little bit more atmosphere in the shot. It's not much, although it's pretty much, but it will give you a little bit more of a bite, which I really like. Nice. 
Now this is without that strobe, and now let's turn the back strobe on again. There we go. So you can see the difference right after each other. This is without, and this is with. Nice, Nadine. Awesome. That, that's nice. Oh, eyes wide open. Awesome. Chin down just a little bit. Love that pose with your hands. Very, very nice. Okay, I think we got enough shots for this set. Let's go into Photoshop and see what we can do with this amazing setup. So we're going to switch over to cameras and we're going to see what we can do. And Nadine, of course, is going to change for the next setup. Okay. There's a question. Okay, I think there will be a lot of questions. So we're going to do those first. So let me switch to my personal camera. There we go. That's camera four. Hello. And let's switch to a full screen. And there we go. Okay, let's first do some questions. Okay, just a little reminder to advertise the workshop in Duisburg at March 5th. I just did. March 5th in Duisburg, Germany. We have a great workshop. Now, if you want to know more about it, go to my website. And let me see where my website is. That's actually here. So go to there, frankdorov.com. And we have a lot of information there on the left side menu. You see all the workshops we do on location. But I'm going to go there in a moment. In the, at the end of the broadcast, we're actually going to show you something more about the workshops. Okay, another question. Let me see. Happy New Year from Switzerland. Thank you so very much. Hey, both. And Nadine, congratulations. Ah, that's nice. Nadine just got married, not to me, but to somebody else. Also a great photographer. Let me see. Johan, how many shoots do you normally take to have that one photo that you will edit in Photoshop? You know, that really, really depends on the mood and on the, on the scene that I do. Sometimes I take the first shot and I go like, this is it. Stop. But then you shoot a little bit more and you find out that there's so much more in that shot. So you can actually push it a little bit further. Or you see a shot and you go like, nah, that sucks. And you do a little bit more and then sometimes you find out that that first shot was actually great. It all depends on how your state of mind is. And sometimes my state of mind during the photo shoot is different than when I select. So I normally will shoot... This is about what I will do when I do a free work. So let me see how many did I shot about... Oh, I didn't reset the counter. 1,600, that sounds a little bit too much. But let's say I shot about 20, 30 shots. So that, that will be approximately what I do normally. Because then I also have some room for what my model likes. Okay, let me see if we have more. Um, Navarro pictures. Hey Frank, can you tell me which camera and mostly lens you use and why? Okay, th this is so incredibly cool. It's a question I hear all the time and you can't answer the question. That's so, so weird. I have my personal favorite in the studio, that's the Sony a7R II, great, great camera, and the Sony 24-70 G Master 2.8. I just love the G Master series. They're insanely sharp. You almost, well, you almost cut yourself on the quality. That's kidding, of course. But it's insanely sharp lens. On the other hand, some people go to the workshop and they go like, okay, I'm going to use the same stuff that you do. And they end up with the 70 to 200 and take their own shots way better than they did with the 24 to 70. It's really personal. I can't tell you what's the best. Remember one thing. I always make the joke during a workshop like, okay, do you shoot Canon? Okay, that's okay. Do you shoot Nikon? Do you shoot Sony? Okay, that's awesome. But in the end, I always follow that joke up with a very simple expression. It's just a tool. Cameras are just tools. It doesn't matter what camera you use. It doesn't matter what lens you use as long as you get the shots that you're after. And you can do that with anything. You can do it with your, with your iPhone or your Android phone or your Windows phone. It doesn't matter. Okay, smoke or haze, do you prefer? In the next setup, we're actually going to use smoke. So that's going to be interesting, I think. Um, how do you come up with those setups? Where do you get your inspiration from? Now, this setup was actually invented by Nadine. And if I... Let me put it this way. This question we will answer in the next segment because we're actually going to interview Nadine for that. Uh, what camera are you going to get to replace the Sony a7R 2 <laughs> 
I'm not going to replace the camera soon. As soon as the A9, the, the most anticipated camera, um, I don't know if it ever will be released, but that's the camera that a lot of people talk about. That will be the next Sony flagship. I will probably switch over to the A9 if it comes out, but I want that smaller form factor and I'm totally in love with the E mount. Now, before that I had an A mount, which I absolutely adored, but the E mount is way more interesting because with the E mount I can fit every single lens that was ever made. And there's even a converter now where you can make manual focusable lenses into autofocus lenses. And the R is for resolution, that's correct. I don't know if that's really uh, what it's meant, but probably yes. Okay, and we do have anything on Facebook, otherwise we're going to go into the retouching part. No, just some greetings from everybody. Okay, so can you do this for me? And then we're going to switch over to my desktop. Oops, don't destroy my own computer. There we go, I'm now behind the computer myself, that's why I look that way. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's see what we do. Now I'm working on the Wacom Cintiq, the 27 inch, which I absolutely love. Oh, 61 images we shot. Minus three, so that's 58. Okay, the first thing I always do is I go through my images to see which ones I like. And the ones that I like, that will actually jump out to me immediately. So this is the tempo which I normally go through the images. Now, for example, why don't I take this shot? I can show you very quickly. If I go to the zoom in, you can actually see that the eyes are pretty dark. And I don't want that, I want the eyes to sparkle. So that's why I always tell my model, okay, look towards the light, as you can see here. Now you can actually see that she has little cat slides in her eyes, so that's way better. Okay, I like the part where she was holding the saucer and the cup. Ooh, really like this one. I'm gonna give this five stars because I like the distant look. Oh, this one is even better, give it five stars. Let me see, I like her feet here a little bit better, give it five stars. Oh, this is even better, five stars. No, I don't like the close-ups here. This is something you really have to see from a distance. This is nice. This one is also cool. It's like she's pointing out. Let's give it five stars. Love the way, oh, this is cool. Why she's caressing the cart. Oh, like that maybe, no, I don't like the floating hand. If you look here, you see that the hand is actually floating a little bit more. And that's something I don't like. So I'm gonna take that one out. This is with the dog in. Let me see, I like the one where she's actually holding her feet up. So let me see where those are. Oh, the blowing ones are also nice, so let's take one of those. It's like being in the candy store. Like, uh, take one of those, take one of those. There we go, really like this. The only thing I don't like is, if you look at the blue here, you see that it's a lot on her face. And I don't like the shape it's creating. And I think in the later images, there we go, that was a little bit better. Like here. And here you see more of her jawline. This one is cool. It's a very tricky way to choose. Okay, now I sort on rating, so that means if I now go back, I can actually see all my five stars. And what I will do is I will actually go through them again. And this time I will actually go like, okay, don't like this one anymore. This one is cool. This one is better. I like her feet better here, so zero. This one I like. Uh, let me see. Yep, like that one better. And I only want to take one shot. This one is cool. Like that one better. Uh, let me see, is that really true? Yeah. That one is way better. And we already have one with the cup and saucer, so let's take those two and this one. And this one now uh, with the... I don't know. Now, let's take this one with the dog. Okay, so now we have four images left. And I told you I only want one, but you know... Sometimes we take more. Okay, let's retouch this one. Now, because I'm using my light meter, I don't really have to do anything in Capture One for raw developing, for the very simple reason I already did everything. So, everything is correct. Now, of course, you can do in your raw converter, you can do all kinds of stuff, like, for example, ratio shadows, but I don't want it. You can correct your highlights, but I don't, I don't need it because I shot with the light meter. And this is actually how I, I like it. So let's go into Photoshop. Now in Capture One we have recipes. And now it's actually on go to Photoshop, make a TIFF, uncompressed Adobe RGB, and open up Photoshop 2017. There we go. And 
process. Awesome. There we go. Oh, by the way, if you think that my desktop looks different, you're absolutely right. There's no more Mac in our studio. Well, there is Macs in the studio. We are still using Wirecast for on a Mac. And Anaweek and the interns are still using Macs. But my studio PC at the moment is literally a PC. We changed over to the dark side. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we have to do is actually the skin. Now, Nadine has pretty good skin, but I want it a little bit softer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a filter and I'm going to use ImageNomic Portraiture. Uh, ImageNomic Portraiture is like the hidden secret for a lot of photographers. They will never tell you they use it, but I know that a lot of the professionals will use ImageNomic for the very simple reason it's the best option out there. And now I don't want to overdo it, but in this case I do, because it's a surreal image, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do this on a high. And that's pretty aggressive, as you can see in a moment. As you can see, this is before and after. It's a pretty aggressive setting. Oops. Okay, now let's select the skin tones. There we go, that's a little bit better. Okay, awesome. Press OK. Now, it's outputted on a separate layer, and you can see how fast this goes. And that's the reason why we actually switched to a PC. It's now rendering in the background. I will switch this over so you guys can actually see what's going on. And this is a pretty intense filter. We're using pretty intense uh, images, sorry, uh, resolutions. So before and after. Now let me go to 100% so you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so this is with the filter and this is without. As you can see, it just cleans up the skin. And I don't want it on the whole shot, because although they tell you it's only on the face, trust me, it's also in other areas. For example, here are skin tones. Now, if I turn it off, you can actually see there's a little bit more detail now. It's not much, but I just want it on their face. Now, in Photoshop, there's a really cool thing. And now you can do layer, layer mask, hide all. In this case, I'm going to hide everything. Okay, let me see. There are some questions coming in. Uh, what kind of uh, fog fluid do you use? I see medium, high density. I always use medium, Andries. And Johan, great to see you go, oh, this one is good, oh, this one is better. I have the same here looking through my images. That's the way you do. You have to make sure that you have everything that you like. Okay, now because I have a black piece of paper, I can actually switch over to white. And of course, you can use short keys for this, the X key. And you can switch between black and white. There we go. Okay, make sure that you don't miss anything. Now, if you also follow quite frankly, you actually saw me updating my series with a new simple trick called the magic of the backslash. Now, the cool thing is, I know a lot about Photoshop, but this one I didn't know. And actually one of my students, hello Ineke, she actually told me about this one. And that's the cool thing. You can always learn new stuff. Because if I want to see what I'm doing here, you can actually now use the backslash key. And now I can see what I've painted, and I see that I'm very sloppy. So let's correct that, of course. Let's press the X key. There we go. So that's the backslash key, guys. A really cool tip. I'm very glad that somebody told me this one, because it saves me a lot of time. Because normally I have to zoom in and see what I'm doing. And with the skin, you don't have to be too precise, because it, it won't be in this area. So if I'm a little bit sloppy, no problem at all. It will be okay. There we go. Okay. And of course, use the backslash again to take the filter off. Oh, let me make sure that I'm here. There we go. Okay. Now, what I always do is layer flat an image. A lot of people tell me don't. I always do it. Now, to give the image a little bit more pop, I'm used to using, in the Mac series, I always used Mac Fun Intensify, which I absolutely love and I still advise you guys to buy because it's an awesome, awesome plugin. But hey, Mac Fun means Mac. And I'm not on a Mac. I'm at a PC at the moment. So we have to find an alternative. And luckily, there is an alternative. There are actually two. 
If you go to Topaz Labs, you have two that are really great, Topaz Clarity and Topaz Detail. Let me start by using Clarity because I want that on the background. Now this is a really intense filter. It takes a lot of time to render and as you can see on this PC it doesn't, but normally it takes a lot of time to render. I already have some uh, presets here which I can use to give it a slight pop or a little bit more. And here you can see the original and with the effect in. So I really like this on the background. If you look at the background, you can really see that it enhances the background. So let's do OK. And now you can see that it takes some time to render. Well, there's a question on Facebook. OK, question on Facebook. Ask me. Is the mirrorless camera applicable to studio? I have a Canon 5D Mark III and Sony A7 II, but Canon beats it. The okay, the question is, is a mirrorless camera good for the studio? I'm shooting studio with it. And the other thing is, he said his Canon beats the Sony. I don't know what he's doing with it, but I shoot medium format and I'm shooting Sony and I shot Canon. And my Canons were blown away by the Sonys. So I don't know what magic Canon he has. And I don't hate Canon. I have a big, big Canon heart. I love Canon. But in dynamic range and in the studio pure resolution, there's nothing that beats the A7R2 except medium format. So I think maybe try it again with the Sony because maybe there was something wrong with the camera settings or whatever, but it should be way more sharper than the Canons. Okay, so I deleted my whole filter and I'm gonna do something that I normally always do with this. I'm gonna paint it in. So I'm gonna make my brush bigger and I'm only going to paint it in on the background, as you can see here. And a little bit on the dog, and a little bit here. And I feel like Bob Ross. Now, if you kids don't know Bob Ross, shame on you. Find him online. He's amazing. And in the end, I could have better probably chose to show all, because I'm actually almost painting the effect in the whole photo. And this is something that I love to do. Just, just imagine as you go. I never know what I'm going to do, because this is the cool thing about Photoshop. You can do so much, and I never know what I like and how I like it. In the end, I think it's better to just do the whole shot, and I'm a little bit too late for that now, of course, but I'm actually now using it on everything, so that's pretty cool. Okay, as you can see here on the mask, I'm still missing some stuff. So there we go with the magic backslash. So as you can see, that is a really cool trip. tip. Sorry, And of course, you can also use your paint bucket and just paint it white, but I'm lazy today. Actually, this takes more work. But anyway, you know what I mean. Okay, I don't want it on the face. So now I have the effect everywhere. There we go. Don't want it on the face, so I'm actually going to switch back with the X key to black. And I'm just going to take it out of the face area. There we go. On the hands it's okay, but on the face I'm always a little bit worried. There we go. Love this. Really nice. Layer. Flatten image. Again, I'm always doing that flatten image. A lot of people tell me, don't make groups or whatever, but you know what? It works for me. And sometimes you just have to follow your own workflow. Okay, let's zoom into our model and let's see if we forgot something. Well, here it's a little bit rough. So I will take my uh, healing brush, make it really small. Oops, alt click and just take this out, maybe a little bit here, that annoys me, there we go. Since the last update from Photoshop, the Wacom is acting up a little bit, they didn't do that before, I guess they're going to fix that in the next release, sometimes I have to press two or three times. I also had the same problem on the Mac, so it's not something that's PC related, before you guys go there. Okay, that looks better. Now this I can also take out of course, so let's do it. Awesome. Okay. 
there we go. The only thing I now have to do is make sure that I like what I see. And in that case, I mean, I have to tint my image. I absolutely love tinting. But before that, I want to show you something else that I always do with these kind of shots that are actually for my own portfolio. I create a new layer and I'm going to use the dodge tool. And with the dodge tool, I'm just going to go very quickly over some midtones here to brighten it up just a little bit. This is a little bit called painting with light. Just make this. And it's not something I could have fixed with lighting because it's actually, I don't want the whole area to be lit up, just a little bit. So we're actually painting in lighting that should never ever be there. And that's the interesting thing about Photoshop. You can really change some stuff. And some people will go like, yeah, but it's not traditional photography and you're a fan of traditional. Well, this is traditional photography because in the dark room we actually use the technique called dodge and burn, in which you actually did approximately the same. So open up the eyes a little bit. And I know, I still do it. Okay, let's... That was a little bit too much on her face. There we go. Okay. On the face, I'm always a little bit more careful. Don't want to blow out anything. Now, we do the same thing for the highlights. And let's just... have to be careful that I don't blow out any of the reds. There we go. Really like this. No, that's too much, too obvious. I don't want too obvious in my retouching, so let's take the brush up a little bit and just dab it. There we go, that's way better. Okay, I like this. No, that's too much. On the, on the card it's too much, you see that it's too obvious, so just do it like this. There we go, that's better. Now, it doesn't look like much, but see if I turn it off. See the difference? It really, really makes an image pop a little bit more. Okay, layer, flatten image. And now I want to tint it. So for tinting, I always use something called Alien Skin Exposure 2. We sometimes also use DxO Film Pack, which I also love. But in this case, eh, I'm already doing that. In this case, I actually want to do it like this. Now, I have to change something, guys, one moment, because I normally have my preview on the top monitor. One moment. So I'm going to see if I can bring that back for you guys. There we go. Oops. Trying to do this with one hand, that's not very smart, of course. But let me do it anyway. The reason I have this on the top monitor is the Wacom is very, very cool for retouching, but it's not so good as a, um, how do you call that, as a display. And the BenQs are very, very good in color rendering. So that's why we actually use the BenQs for uh, color checking. Okay, so let's go through the presets and let's choose one of the cinema ones. I think I really love those. Because I want that little bit of a old-fashioned film style. There we go. This is pretty intense. This is nice. The only thing I don't like is all the junk in the back. So let's take that out. So let's go to overlays and just turn that all off. There we go. Now let's see a before and after, if I can still manage that, one moment. There you go, do a before and after. I think it's a little bit too dark, this one. Okay. And the cool thing about alien skin is you can actually just move your cursor around and just get the shots. There we go. Wizard of Oz with a haze. This I really like. Makes it a little bit less contrasty. So we're going to put some exposure back in. There we go. Gives it a little bit more of a blown out look. There we go. This is cool. A little bit of contrast. And very little vibration. Sorry, vibrance, vibration. Come on. 
That's really nice. Okay, let's keep it that way. The thing you always have to do is make sure you store this as a preset. So let's call this very quickly Haze 2. And do it in existence. Uh, don't do it in existence. Just press OK. And press Apply. OK. It's now working. There we go. And we have a before and after. Really love this shot. Really, really nice. OK, let's do file close. Uh, sorry, first, first um, flat an image. And then let's go to file close. And it will be saved. And let's go back to capture one. Of course, we can do the other ones, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to do that tonight for you guys. So that will be very, very nice. OK, let's see. Uh, let's do some questions and I'm going to switch to my camera so you guys can see me. I always think that's nicer when you speak to somebody that you can actually see them. Okay. Um, Ferdi, Ferdi van der Sanden. Uh, Frank, why did you go from Mac to PC? Now, I, I don't want to go into a lot of that stuff because you can read it online. In short, when Apple released the new MacBook Pro, I was totally sitting on the corner of the seat going like, this is it. This is going to be absolutely awesome. They're going to revolutionize the laptop market. And in all honesty, I was totally disappointed because uh, there was a small speed increase, uh, but it became flatter, uh, lighter, and I'm not waiting for lighter or flatter. I'm waiting for a great machine. Now, they had this big, huge trackpad, and I was going like, okay, let's take out the Apple Pencil and start drawing on the, on the trackpad. That's going to be awesome because we tested out the um, uh, Microsoft Surface Studio and I loved it. The, sorry, the Microsoft Surface Pro, so the, the portable tablet. I loved it, but I found that the screen was too small. So I couldn't draw on it very well. And I was going like, okay, I would prefer to draw on the screen, but if I can't draw on the screen, let's just do it on the trackpad. Why not? And I will be in line for that laptop. Although the pricing, I think, is ridiculous at the moment. So I cancelled my own because there was no support for the Apple Pencil. And at that point, we were also testing the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. And the Mobile Studio Pro literally blew me away. It's great to draw on the screen. It's way better than anything else that I tried. But it's running Windows 10. And as a Mac user, I was going like, Windows 10, oh my, I don't, I don't want to go to Windows. In all honesty, it worked flawlessly. We tried it out during photo shoots. We really stress tested this baby, like going up in temperature for the CPU up to, I believe at one point it just topped out at 85 degrees under a lot of stress with rendering and in the meantime painting something. And it slowed down because it's only a dual core. But I was very impressed with Windows. And after that, you saw the interviews with some of the guys from Apple. And I think, and this is just my thought, don't, don't say later, Frank, you were wrong, because of course I can be wrong. If you see all the stuff going on with Apple at the moment, they're focusing on iPads, iPhones, and probably MacBooks. But they have to be lighter, and they lose the creative persons. You see professional setups with two monitors. We run with three monitors. We use the Wacom, and we use two monitors. If I also want to charge my computer, I'm forced to buy one of their monitors, which I don't want to buy. I want to use my bank use. So that's a problem. And you only have four ports. Now, of course, you can use a hub, but that's another 250 euros. And the hub is only available in March. So everything combined, I was just going like, OK, I want a new Mac Pro. And then you hear something like, we don't want to go into details, but we won't forget the desktop, something exciting is coming. And at one point I was just going like, you know what, I'm going to try out, I'm going to buy the most expensive PC parts, and I'm going to build something, and if I don't like it, I can always go back. And I believe, in a week, 3,000 euros we were in. So we spent about 3,000 euros, and we bought an X99 board, Rick's, uh, Strix Gamer from Asus, we bought a GT180 from Asus, uh, Corsair power supply, 1200 watts, which is, according to some, overkill, but we use a lot of USB devices and a lot of stuff inside. And we bought, uh, let me see, the 9600K from Intel. And I have to be honest, I, I built the set on a 32 meg, uh, gigabyte um, RAM and an M2 drive SSD for you guys knowing that it's an insanely fast drive. It gets about 2,500 megabytes of read, and the Mac topped out at 950. So 
I'm testing it on Windows 10 and it's incredibly stable, it's insanely fast and everything just works. So it's a total experience I had before with Windows. We actually started with Windows I think in 3.11 all the way up to Windows 8. That's where we stopped doing computers and we focused 100% on photography. So I missed Windows um, 8.1 I believe and I don't think I missed a lot. And we just stepped in at Windows 10. So very, very cool, very, very fast. And I still love Apple, don't get me wrong. I will not sell my iPhone or whatever. But for computers, I think Apple is uh, not listening anymore to the professionals. Okay, um, I already answered what PC did you buy? Marco Herman, 10 minutes. I don't know what you mean with 10 minutes, Marco, but if you, if you want something, just let me know. Okay, uh, Frank built a PC himself. He could not cope with the new Mac having two less ports. Uh, that's not really the case. It has enough ports, but I wanted also to be able to use USB 3.1, or in other words, Thunderbolt 3. And the Mac Pro doesn't have it, so I had to wait until the end of the year to use USB 3.1. And because Anaweek is using USB 3.1, <laughs> it was just a mess. Uh, if they do something, let's do it over the whole line. So, But enough about that. Do you also have a printed portfolio? No, not anymore. Everything is online or on my iPad. I have an iPad Pro with me for clients and I just show the images on there. But I love prints. Okay, let me see. Are there any more questions on Facebook any week? No. Okay, then we're going to mic Nadine up and we're going to show you very quickly some adverts and we have to do those because we have to switch over and I have to get something to drink, of course. And that's why we show these adverts, but also because those people make this show possible. Oh, very quickly, a uh, question. Did you try the new BenQ SW320? It's behind me. We're going to set it up after digital classroom. It looks stunning. 4K monitor and it really looks great. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show you guys is actually our brand new instructional video, Beyond Snaps New York, and you guys are the first who's going to see the trailer which Anna Week worked her but off over and she really likes it. So here we go, Beyond Snaps, New York, and you really have to get this one. I think it's the best instructional video we ever did on street and travel photography. Well, that's only the second one, of course, but I think it's the best one we ever filmed. So there we go. New York, without a doubt, one of the most beautiful places in the world for street photography. In this video, Beyond Snaps New York, we're not only going to show you tips and tricks about gear, getting great shots, uh, locations, how to talk to people and much, much more. But we're also going to show you some places that you may or may not have heard of, of New York. How about two Chinatowns? You probably know one. We actually found another one that's way more interesting. How about a location where you can get great, great night shots? Or Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash, Amityville. This video is jam-packed with not only photography tips and techniques, but also great locations to visit when you go to the New York area. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this video. In my opinion, it's one of the best we ever made. So enjoy Beyond Snaps to New York. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorf and I want to tell you today about a new 27-inch monitor from BenQ. Now, I'm a fashion photographer and I like my colors to be as they are in real life. Because I do my best to light my scene correctly, to style the scene, to have great makeup, great model. And then I see my images on a monitor and they look like, well, very dull. Well, that can happen to you too and it will probably happen to you. You know the problem? Your monitor is not up to spec. Now, a monitor isn't a monitor. It's not something that just shows you the image. There are many different kinds of monitors, like TV sets. You have very expensive ones, which will give you better image quality, right? Now, with computer monitors, we always tell people it's all about the color space. For example, you have an sRGB monitor, or for the professionals, an Adobe RGB monitor. But if you don't know what that means, it doesn't make any sense. Now, let me make it simple. These are the colors in real life. So this is what you capture, right? It's, it's great, it's vibrant, it's saturated, it's real life. Now, an sRGB monitor, it's a really small color space. And that's okay for the web or for a laptop or just simply browsing your images. But if you want those more vibrant colors, you need something a little bit bigger. 
And that's an Adobe RGB color space. It's just a bigger color space. But it also means that the monitor has to show those colors. Now, in the past, those monitors were pretty expensive, especially a 27 inch. And BenQ really, really made me enthusiastic about this monitor because it's very affordable. It's delivered with a hood. So in other words, it will cut down on your glare. And it's, well, well, I can give you all the bells and whistles about it. Like it has all the inputs you need. It has all the specs. It's 99% Adobe RGB. But in the end, it all boils down to one thing, image quality. And I'm very picky. And as you can see, it's my main editing monitor at the moment. So I'm very, very enthusiastic about the monitor. If you are looking for a great monitor and you want something in the 27 inch, and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money on it, check out the new BenQ 27 inch. And for me, the most important thing is that it has a hardware calibration option, meaning you use their own software and you use a calibrator. And you can really make sure that the reds are as red as they are intended. Now, I know a lot of monitors come with this sheet, like I'm calibrated in the factory. That's great, but it doesn't make any sense because your computer is different. So you have to recalibrate. Now, when do you recalibrate? I always recalibrate before a very important retouch session. For example, if I have to do a wedding or a fashion shoot, I will just let my monitor warm up for half an hour or an hour, do the calibration, and then I do my retouching. That way, I know for sure that my colors are accurate. So, thank you. Job well done. I'm very, very happy with the monitor. And you guys, if you're in the market for a new monitor, check out the new BenQ series because they're really knocking one out of the ballpark with this series. And if I'm correct, you now see us sitting here. Hello Nadine. Hi. And you now have audio on two persons. This is what you wanted, this is what you're gonna get. So, what is the meaning of this part? What I wanna ask Nadine is actually, how does he think about styling? How does he, what goes on in her mind? Now we already did a video, Mastering the Model Shoot 3, Creativity with Nadine. And let me first tell you something. Many, many years ago, I was on the professional imaging and one of my models got sick. And this is actually where Nadine came in for the first time. She wanted to do that photo shoot for me on professional imaging and we hit it off really, really cool. And her first photo shoot with me, she wanted to be a rock star. And this was the difference between other models. Normally I had to push those models to be something else. They all wanted to be pretty girls. So I always told them like, okay, do this, do something with toilet paper, do something with a cup and saucer in your head, do something with, and they always thought I was stark raving mad, but they did it. They saw the images and they were going like, this is really cool. And with Nadine, I finally found somebody that I didn't have to push. She actually came in and she said, I don't want to be on the picture like a pretty girl. What I want to be on the picture is like a rock star. And I want a little bit of water here. So she wasn't just thinking about portraying that rock star. She was immediately two steps ahead. A little bit of water here, a little bit of dirt, a little bit of this and a guitar. And that was just amazing. So after that, we started working more and more together and we made a deal. Every photo shoot should be more spectacular and more interesting. The problem is we never expected, of course, to be working together for six, seven years, eight? Since 2008, we're working together. 2008, that's eight years. I know marriages that don't last that long. Almost nine. Almost nine years. So In March nine. <laughs> Jeez, that's a long time. So we don't, of course, do it spectacular more and more every time. What we now actually agreed upon, if we take the perfect shot, we will not work together anymore. So every time when Nadine is done, she asks me, was it perfect? And sometimes I almost say yes, and then I immediately recover, said, no, well, you know, we're almost there. Just a little bit more. I never it's, ask if it is perfect. I ask if, if, it's it was, good. if it was okay. Yeah, if it was okay. And I always tell her, yeah, almost. So that, that's a little bit of an inside joke. So Nadine, what goes on in your mind when you start creating something, when uh, you want to create art? Well, it's pretty messy in my mind, I think. But um, most of times I, I read a lot and I, uh, I see a lot of movies and series, but also paintings and photos on the internet. And people around me uh, are my inspiration. It's very cheesy to say, but this is how it works. You see something and it goes in your head and you make something of your own. That's why you always want to do horror when you see me. Yeah. I don't know. Weird. If you guys, by the way, have any question for Nadine, feel free to ask. So Nadine, the previous set, what, was, what were you thinking? What was the main idea? Well, I had a few days off for the first time in, in very, very long. 
And um, I've read a book, and that book uh, was a story about uh, how the uh, Queen of Hearts uh, uh, became uh, how she is. And um, that book was so uh, well over things that that was my inspiration for this one. And on the other hand, uh, I've married <laughs> a few weeks ago, and I did the decoration myself, but I had all the stuff of the decoration, so <laughs> I, I needed... <laughs> you still a, had everything left. Yeah, well, I needed a cheap way of creating something, so, and it's with all those Christmas balls, but then in a heart uh, shape, so I used that. In other words, you needed a place to dump your stuff. garbage. No, I, I take it with me. <laughs> oh, you take it with you again? Yeah, okay. yeah, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're always kidding around. But there is a lot of time in, in, in designing this stuff, and it's also uh, in hours, it, it, it costs a lot. But uh, with some creativity or people around you, you can do a lot. So normally, yeah, when people go and they go like, okay, you take a photo. And l let me put it this way. We were doing a tour in the UK. I think it was last year. And we saw this pile of junk laying around. And I saw it, Nadine saw it. And she was actually the creative part, so I won't take any credit of that. But I saw it, she saw it. And we both had the idea, this could be something interesting. Now, if she wouldn't have said it, I would have said it. But she was way before me. And she said, Frank, are you okay with me if I do something here? And the cool thing is, we had a second model with us. So I said, okay, I'm going to concentrate with uh, Lena, the second model. And you just be my guest. And... The fun thing is, she created something in maybe 20 minutes that's absolutely stunning. It's amazing. It's like an Alice in Wonderland with even the signs were correct with aiming down. And the whole shot was just absolutely gorgeous. So that took her maybe 20 minutes. But sometimes you also work like hours on a set, right? Yeah, well, if it's paper or plastic, then I need some preparations. It was with the Dragon Lady also. We did it with students, but uh, I was for two weeks uh, busy with folding paper. So there is a lot of preparation in it and there is overthinking in it, but um, I can um, give things out of hands or uh, go with the flow. And I think that's very important because... Um, you have some minions. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of them. No, but I think it's very important that if you work together um, that you can both put something in it. Awesome. And there's a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nadine, what education did you do to get to get from being a model into doing styling? None. The Frank Dorhoff School of no, Art Learning. No, I'm, I'm uh, officially I did a FAO, um, well, uh, and my mother had her hopes high. She wanted me to go to the university and uh, became a lawyer or something like that. Well, um, <laughs> I went to a bakery school, so I learned how to make pies and bread. Awesome. <laughs> so my, my mom's dreams were destroyed. And, uh, and my dreams came true. <laughs> and uh, during my study uh, on the bakery school, I, uh, I, I earned uh, money with modeling. And that were the, just the commercial things. And um, that was a kind of boring. And so I started uh, with styling next to it. You know, that, that's what you hear a lot. Like, people sometimes ask me, like, how did you become a photographer? And the story is very cool. I just grew up in a family that was obsessed with images and video. And we had the first, like, Betamax recorders where you put the tape in on front here to slam it down. And I was into movies. I remember the first experience that Anna Week actually got with me is normally you invite a girl over to your room and you do certain stuff. You know what I mean? I didn't. I watched movies. <laughs> as he liked it actually so th th this is something that was brought to me from very young and you just grow in it and if you have passion for it like Nadine Nadine lost what she now imagine this you, you have to fold paper for six hours and you hate it do you like it then no but I wish it were six hours I think it's 60 hours my hands yeah. are most of the time very ugly and 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 uh, how do you call it you see the the the, the wounds on it from the paper cuts? No, not from the paper cuts, just because I have to cut the papers. I first cut papers and then I fold them and then I cut them again or something like that. And then I have to pin them up on the safety pins. And <laughs> but if you don't love what you do, you see it as a chore. And see actually, and that's the same with me, even if we work for hours, we love what we do. Another question, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, 
do you have to use a different style of makeup? Um, in other words, uh, have your foundation and stuff like that to deal with Frank's hard lighting setups? Well, I have makeup from makeup artist and Mac, but I also use just the ordinary day makeup, Clinique. So I, I invest a lot in uh, good makeup, but that's also because I have a very dry skin and sometimes I do also the makeup of other models and then you want to be sure that you have good stuff because you don't want them to get an allergic reaction or something like that. Now one of the things that I hear in that question is because of Frank's hard lighting setups. Now do realize my lighting isn't hard. This is something that a lot of people mis misunderstand about what I do with lighting. Now I have very focused light, meaning my light hits the model on a certain spot, but it's still soft boxes. So if I take the grid off, you have an incredibly soft light. What I'm actually doing is I'm using a soft box and I'm angling that all that softness, all that goodness, all that gooey stuff, I'm aiming that at my model. So although the light source is relatively small, which make the lights harder, it's still a soft quality of light. Now, it would be different if I would be using open reflectors or reflectors with grids. Those are really nasty light sources. And your model will look like she ate the whole Hershey factory the day before the <laughs> photo shoot because she will have all these dimples and whatever. Everything will show up. But because we're using those smaller light sources, uh, sorry, those bigger light sources, those soft boxes with grids, you actually get a relatively soft light quality. Any more questions about the styling? One more. Um, do you have people who inspire you, Nadine? Uh, well, not particular ones, but I have a lot of people who inspire me. I buy, buy a Vogue and it inspires me. Puka inspires me and she's a model of Frank. So, yeah, I have a lot of people that inspire me. And I get inspired by Nadine. So <laughs> let me say it. And, and folks are great if you have to change your oil in your car. Absolutely amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. We Espe were Especially the cover. Especially the cover. We were in the UK and we actually had to change the oil in our car. And we didn't know that. We just bought the car. <laughs> and we were there. Don't laugh. And the thing was, it was very deep inside the motor engine. So, and we're both, we're all, we're not very technical guys. So I know how a camera works, but I don't know how to change my oil. So we opened it up and we were just standing there. And I imagine this and we were sitting in the car and Nadine and I were going like, where should the oil go? And she said over there, I said, no, no, that's the fluid from the, uh, from the, from the wipers. Yeah. <laughs> so we finally found it somewhere deep in. The problem is, how do you get the freaking oil inside that deep in compartment? So we went inside. Do you have something that will funnel it in? No. Okay. So, okay, let me take a Coke bottle and just cut it open, put it, no, it didn't work. So at one point Nadine was going like, uh, yeah, I just bought this beautiful folk and the cover is all shiny and okay, just rip it up. So they ripped it up and we put it in, put all the oil in and we were done. Now we were driving for like, I think two minutes and Anna Week was actually reading the manual of my car. And she already told us where the oil should be and then she flipped the page over. In the back of the car, there's actually something to put the oil into the engine block. We both looked at Anna Week. If, if we could kill with our looks, I kid you not, she wouldn't be here. She would have exploded like a Samsung Galaxy. <laughs> she would have been gone. But in the end, we put four liters of motor oil in, which later I found out is way <laughs> too much. But we had this beautiful smoke coming out of our rear and it, the whole car just was very smooth. It, it was a smooth ride. It, it never recovered, by the way, after that. So if you put oil in, don't do four liters. So that's not a good thing. Do you have any more questions? Last one. Oh, the last one. There we go. Is Nadine going to be the model on PE this year? On professional imaging? I don't know. I don't know. In all honesty, I, I don't know. Are uh, you going to be on professional imaging? I think this is our last time, isn't it? Why? <laughs> oh, now you're in shock. Yes, of course I am. Of course he is. There isn't a show I would do without Nadine. Actually, we will be doing also imaging days in Belgium with Nadine. And the cool thing is, for you Americans, Photoshop World is coming up in April. Now, Photoshop World is without a doubt one of the best and most inspirational three days in the world on photography. I'm teaching there. I'm doing a pre-con even. And I have Nadine with me. 
So that means that on stage we'll be talking about styling, we'll be talking about what you can do, and it's going to be just freaking awesome. It's going to be one of the best shows I ever did in the States. And even better, on April 30th will be the two of us, and of course if Anna Week still behaves after that, because that's after two weeks, we'll also bring Anna Week. We will be in New Jersey in the studio from our good friend Neil from Newkirk, and we're going to use his studio for a workshop and we just started promoting it and we're already half full so if you want to join that workshop go to our website and in the end we'll show you a little trailer about that but Nadine is going to be with us there and after that we're actually also going to go to the UK in June for an ultimate weekend in Emerson close to London so you will be seeing Nadine a lot and in Germany and in Germany and Belgium so yeah and workshops here and ultimate weekend here oh my you should have married me. Yeah, I had. But yeah. you are already married. I'm already married. So. I'm going to switch faith. I can have three wives. <laughs> yeah, no, you can I'm switch your faith, but if she doesn't, it won't help you <laughs> a lot. That's true. Let's do some more photography. 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 Let's do some cool stuff. Okay, Nadine, so what was your idea with the next set? We have something behind us with chandeliers yeah, and everything. It's going to be a little bit burlesque. A little bit burlesque. A Ooh. little bit burlesque. Uh, yeah. Moulin Rouge. Uh, Moulin Rouge. Give it a name. <sighs> Ooh, that sounds interesting. Yeah. I'm going to change my lighting for a little bit more uh, direct. Oh, Anna Week has a question. Two questions. Uh, will you make a shoot with more than one model? Without a doubt, during the ultimate weekend in our studio in Emmeloord. And normally, I would really love that. What people have to realize is that during workshops, we're always limited in budget. So if I have to hire two models, the workshop will be tremendous amount more expensive. So that's also why we focus a lot on one model. But during the ultimate weekend, we always have a male model and a female model. And during our open house, we actually had three models. I would love to do something with more models on stage. But maybe during professional imaging, because then we already have a lot of models. So make sure you check out professional imaging. It's in Nijkerk. It's on 18, 19 and 20 of March. And we have great speakers like Glyn Dewars, Christiane Schurk, Jan Vermeer. We have me and we have a really cool one coming up. And you know the cool thing, Nadine, and I'm so excited about this. One of my heroes in retouching and surreal stuff and painting. And I can't tell you his name yet because he's going to be announced this week. He's from Germany. He has clients like BMW, Mercedes. That was the mail I had. Yeah, that was the mail yeah. you had. We're going to do something that will blow your mind on stage. Now, that was a little bit too enthusiastic, but it will blow your mind. And what we're going to do is Nadine and I are going to do a shot in front of a gray seamless. We're going to do that in two or three minutes. And this guy, he's going to make his Wacom smoke because <laughs> he's going to create something amazing. Now, I don't know if you have Nadine on a photo, if you have to do a lot of work, but he's going to create in 45 minutes a painting of Nadine of my photo. And again, working with somebody like that, it's amazing because I already follow his work for many years and I absolutely love his work. So next week or this week, we're going to announce who that is, but make sure you check him out on professional imaging. It's going to be freaking awesome because that guy, I kid you not, that's a real artist. And it's the first time we're ever going to do something like that on stage. Normally it was very video and photography based. And now we're actually going to add graphic design and painting with it. So it's going to be a totally new show. So make sure you check out professional imaging in the Netherlands. And we've done a lot on social media already about it. It's literally the best show out there in the Netherlands. So make sure you check that out. And we had another question. Oh, I'm getting so exciting about that. Yeah, there's another question for Nadine. Uh, Nadine, you have to spend a lot of money for your styling, or do you have any sponsors? I don't have sponsors, so if you want to sponsor me, <laughs> no. She will be on Patreon <laughs> very soon. <laughs> no, I um, reuse a lot of stuff, uh, and yes, it costs things, but I also try to be very creative in things like uh, the materials. So, um, And I have a vintage store, just sometimes if things are broken or, or um, it doesn't sell, then I also use it. And, and the cool thing is, of course, when you, when you do the shoots, and wh what a lot of people don't realize, you have to invest because if she looks just plain stunning every time, people will hire her. And I, this morning I had a conversation with somebody about it and he said, how much do you do for free and for ridiculous amounts of money in the term of too low and paid? 
And I think with every single job, maybe every single job, like if you're a carpenter or a woodworker or whatever, it's what we call in the Netherlands, uurtje factuurtje. That means every hour is being invoiced. Photography is such an incredibly different job. I think if, if we go like this, what do I do for normal amounts of money? I think 50% of what I do, and this is because I've grown over the years and I get more acknowledged as a name. So 50% I do for normal, normal gauge. I think 25% I do for way too little money. Like we love to do uh, readings at photo clubs. Now that's a three hour demo or not really a demo, but it's a three hour um, uh, speech about travel and street photography, about model photography. And I have to drive there and I have to drive back and we charge very, very little for that. And there's about 25% I do for total free. The cool thing is with that stuff I do for free and very little money, I get a lot of people interested in the workshops and the workshops is where we actually make our money. And this is also why we do Digital Classroom. A lot of people also from the industry have claimed that, I'm to that I've totally lost my mind. Why should you do a two hour live broadcast every month from your studio? Now, If you do like an interview like we're doing now, they understand it, but why do you give so much information? The thing is, what I teach you now is nothing compared to what we have on commercial videos. So I hope to inspire you guys that if you like this, you buy our commercial videos. And this is one of the best business tips I can give you guys. Do what you do, but do it with passion. And then if you do it with passion, you don't mind that you don't get paid full price. If I ask uh, Nadine, do you want to do a photo shoot with me and we make you Harley Quinn like we did recently? I don't have to pay her. She will come over. She loves it. She does it. We have great shots. Now, if I have an assignment, for example, we're going to do Sony and we're going to do uh, something for Letgo maybe, or we do something on professional imaging, those are the paid assignments and those are actually paid out. And I think if you don't do the free stuff in photography, I don't know, it just doesn't work. With photography, you have to do some stuff for little or free to get the big assignments because it's also networking. Do you agree? I agree. Totally. She agrees. Totally. More questions? That's the cool thing about Digital Classroom, guys. Don't be afraid to ask questions because that's why we're here. Well, uh, Paul Meulemans is still in doubt about buying grip, a grid for his deep octa 100 centimeter. Does it really make a difference? Is it worth the big price? Yes, it's absolutely worth the price. Grids on softboxes are the best thing ever because you can really steer your light. On the other hand, you also have to see is it my stuff? Like, if I see Nadine now, I'm getting totally excited. I'm, I'm going like, I love this. I love this outfit. I love the mask. But there, there will be a lot of people, and I've, I've got those mails, and we always call them like, we don't call them hate mails, but sometimes they're really, really nasty. I kid you not. But sometimes they're normal. Let me, let me put it this way. I don't want to go in there. But sometimes people email me like, I don't know why you work with Nadine, because you can do so much better if you have a beautiful girl and you just put her there in lingerie. And all those dresses and all those masks and that extreme makeup and that hair, it's ridiculous. It's his opinion. If he wants to shoot a model that looks just great in lingerie, be my guest. But it's not my thing. When I see Nadine like this, not a nude model can come close, because I don't have anything with nude photography. I love a little bit of glamour with lingerie or covered up nudes and I like, uh, like for example, the, the body scapes with, with nice lighting, but it's not my thing. My thing is the extremeness. So if you are the kind of guy that loves that aimed and focused lighting, those grids in those softboxes are priceless. But if you are the kind of guy that goes like, okay, I just want to light the crap out of something and I want a big light source, be my guest. Don't ever buy a grid. There are people who will literally never buy grids. They will use umbrellas. They will use, if there's a new softbox that's three centimeters bigger, they will buy the new softbox because it's three centimeters. And I just go like, I don't know. I just want that aimed light. Any more questions? Otherwise, we're going to continue. No. No. Okay. Nadine, jump on stage and let's see what we can do. Oh, first we're going to take the mic off, of course. Now, in the comments below, guys, can you aim up instead of here? <laughs> it's, it's a very nice area, but not for those guys, don't. <laughs> okay, so, sorry guys, that was a little bit of false humor. Um, 
Bad humor, by the way. Sorry, bad, bad humor. Now, if you like what we just did with Nadine, let us know in the comments below, because then next time when we have another model, we also do something like an interview style kind of thingy. Okay, so I love the chandeliers over here and there. So let me see, is there a camera that can actually see what I'm pointing out? Okay, cool. So I love the chandeliers. I love everything about it. What I now want to do is I want to make sure that on my model there's a small spot. So I'm going to use this one. And let me put it on not too much power and just aim it all the way up. Now the cool thing about this one is I can actually aim it towards my model and I can change this. Don't ask me which brand it is because I have not the foggiest idea. We bought it many, many years ago. It was very cheap and you can see that it's literally, actually it's junk, but it works. It's junk that works. Now let's just open this up and let me see why this doesn't work. There we go. Okay, and just get it up a little bit more towards knitting. There we go. Close it. And I'll make sure it doesn't trip over because I want to keep Nadine a little bit longer. There we go. Can you see through the grid? Awesome. Now, if she can see through the grid, that actually means she's in the hot spot of the light. And when she's in the hot spot of the light, it means that the light is focused on my model. And that's where I want it to be, because my model is the most important thing. Except, of course, for my wife and my son. But in the photography, the model is my most important thing. So let's take out my light meter. And we're also going to do something else, because we're not going to use any other stuff here, except smoke in a moment. And we're also going to shoot a color checker, which is very important for accurate colors. So let's meter. 8.04. Okay, let's go up. No, let's go down four clicks. Let's go down one, two, three, four. Okay, so that should be F8. There we go. And the first thing I'm going to do is going to shoot the color checker. Now, the color checker is very important. I'm going to show you that very quickly. This is the color checker. Now, the part that you have to focus on is this. Now, in Capture One, it doesn't support the color checker as it does in Lightroom. So, in Capture One, you're going to use one of these. I'll just use one of those two to make a color balance. Nothing more, just a balance. It's like gray balance. A white balance, sorry. Okay, let's go to F8. Make sure that it's flat as possible. Oh turn on the skyport. Always make one image black to see if everything comes in. And then make a second one to make sure. You see, two black ones came in. Awesome. Never ever tell your client you're wrong. Always tell them it was intended that way. Works great. Okay. Mm, let me see. really like this already. So I'm going to sit down. And let me see what we can do. Okay. I want to make sure that my whole model is in the frame. That's absolutely stunning, Nadine. Great. Love it. Very painterly light source. Really like that. And that's just one of the cheapest, actually, deep octas you can get. It's the 70 centimeters, and we're using a honeycomb grid. Now... I know that you guys go like, yeah, it's all honeycomb. No, this is really the brand is called Honeycomb Grids. The only thing is, I don't like the fact that I don't see my second chandelier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my light a little bit higher. And because I'm moving it a little bit higher, I'm actually changing the distance of my light. And let me put it this way. You see this is now what I get. And when I move it higher, it will be like this. So I will get a little bit more of the chandelier in. There we go. Going to aim the light a little bit more that way. And we're just going to guess. Of course, normally we meter, but in this case, let's guess. So, there we go. There we go. Now we have a little bit more of the chandelier. And I actually guessed pretty accurate. Nice. Really love this. But I'm missing something. I think I'm missing a little bit of smoke, girls. Yep, two smoke machines. That's awesome. Smoke, we love smoke. 
Now, I don't like smoking, but smoke we love, right, Nadine? Oh, do that again, what you did. That's nice. Nice, really cool. Okay, girls, are you ready? Okay, first the background, that's for uh, Steffi. And then the front just a little bit. Don't do too much because the light setup is not correct yet, but I want to explain that in a moment. Okay, you fill up the background. Really nice. And you just give a few puffs in the front. Okay, and stop. Okay, what you guys will now see is that actually the smoke isn't really working. <coughs> well, it is working, but not on the pictures. Actually, you see it a little bit. Hello, I don't see anything at all. You see it a little bit, but it's not enough. Now, imagine when you're driving on the road. When do you see the mist or the fog? When do you see it? When you turn on your headlights, it will really jump out. So it's, I always tell people smoke is like a reflector, a deflector, and it blocks light. So what do we have to do? We have to light it from the back. So um, Afra, can you turn on the blue gel again? Are you okay? I'm losing one of my interns. <coughs> Steffi was actually very, very sick and she came in just for Digital Classroom. So that's a trooper. Okay, now as soon as I turn on the backlight, look at the difference. This really makes a huge, huge difference. Because now, because the smoke is actually lit from the back, you get this beautiful effect on the smoke. And sometimes the front strobe doesn't fire and I don't even care because it looks incredibly nice. And this is something that's always the, the case. If sometimes a strobe doesn't go off, you can actually get something where you go like, ooh, but that's interesting. Oh, I really love this. This is really nice. Hmm. And that's just during a digital classroom. It's amazing, Nadine, you rock. You are the best. Okay, now let's do a little bit more with wide angle. Now, if I come closer to my model, now a lot of people will tell you don't ever use wide angles because they distort your model. And that's cool because if they distort your model, you get some really intense shots like this. Oh, front light didn't fire. Chin down just a little bit, Nadine. Nice. So now you get that really long leg, and I really like this. You see the chandeliers coming in? That's really nice. And maybe you can look straight at me like that. Yes. Love it, love it, love it. That's really nice. Go a little bit more here. Nice. Okay, Steffi, can you do some uh, smoke from that side? And then Afra, when I tell you, just a little bit of a puff. So first do it on the back and then up. And smoke, you really have to build up. Okay, Afra towards the blue light. Very nice, and now towards me. Yep. Nice. Cool, chin down. Yes, there we go. Nadine, this rocks. Just a little bit too much smoke in front of her face, but I'm still gonna shoot. I'm also going to change my own position a little bit to get that nice light in the back the, on the shot. That's nice. And she has a little bit too much on her face. Can you remove that a little bit by... I Maybe I can do it. Oh, you can wave it yourself. That's better. Yes, yeah, there we go. That's nice. Awesome. That's it, Nadine. Wow. And of course, when you shoot stuff like this, make sure that you don't shoot between the legs of the model. Or at least make sure that everything looks nice. Of course, later in Photoshop, you can clone it out, but it's better to just make sure that you do it on the shoot. Very nice. Move a little bit more back. Okay. Wave a little bit more in front of your face again. Really nice. There we go. Oops, that's still too much on her face. That's the nice thing about smoke, it really fills up. 
the bad thing about smoke is sometimes you just get too much in front of the face and it just doesn't look right anymore. Now this is better. That's nice. That's cool. And you see that I'm constantly saying that's cool even if I don't have to. I'll still do it. Most of these shots aren't good enough, but I won't tell my model. I will keep telling my model awesome. And why isn't it good enough? Sometimes there's just too much smoke in front of her face. And the next moment it's gone. But if you tell your model no, no, no. You will really see this in your photo shoots. You will get less and less interested. Oh, sorry, less and less intense. Can you uh, wave a little bit in front? A little bit more. There we go. Nice. That's really nice. Okay, Afra, can you change the blue light and aim it at the wall on the back? So just turn it. Just turn it, turn it on the back, on the background. There we go. Yeah. Let's see what happens now. Now we get a little bit of a haze more. So instead of smoke, we now get this really nice, intense blue U behind our model. So it's not really aimed at the front anymore. But we get this really blue, almost atmospheric lighting on the background. Which gives it a totally different look. Now, do you agree with blue or should we do red? <coughs> I think blue is... I think blue is better. Yeah, I think so too. Now, we talk about Moulin Rouge, right? And Moulin Rouge, the first thing you imagine is red. But if you can see in the images, I actually like blue more. It just gives me a different look. I mean, the uh, guys are also seeing Capture One and me small. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's nice. Okay, uh, one more, a little bit of smoke over there. Like yeah, just try a little bit different. Po oh, that's even more interesting. Watch out for, I don't want to kill you yet. Okay, this is hurting you. So let's change that a little bit. There we go. Okay, let's see how this looks. Okay, we have to change the lighting a little bit towards here. There we go. This is nice. Keep it that way. Okay, keep it that way with the finger. Really nice. Now, I'm not really satisfied with the lighting, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this a little bit more back. So I have to make sure that I'm hitting her face with the lighting. There we go. And this is the thing, always listen to your model and the people who are around you. Because sometimes they have great ideas and some photographers are really closed up during a photo shoot and they will go like, no, it's my shoot. No, it's the shoot of all of us. Really nice. Okay, a little bit more smoke on that side, uh, Steffi. Oh, you don't have any smoke anymore. Okay, Afra, a little bit on the background smoke. Really nice. And sometimes I try to include that little light. There we go. And let me do for fun a portrait setting. I hardly shoot portraits. I always shoot landscapes. Uh, the wafer a little bit lower. There we go, really nice. Okay, keep it that way. Nice. Nice, final shots. And there are always a lot of final shots with me. Ooh, that's nice. One of the strokes didn't fire and it gave it a really cool effect. Okay, nice. So let's see what we can do in Photoshop with these images. And I think they're rock solid. Really, really cool. So I'm going to switch over to the computer again. And let's do the final retouches. But of course, first we're going to do some of your questions. Okay. So let's switch back to full screen mode. And there we go. So anyway, you had some questions from Facebook, I guess. Yes. Um, what do you do? Uh, it's about your uh, Wacom. What do you do when, when you want to edit the same picture or other pictures if you want to make adjustments after flattening image? 
Okay, what do I do when I flatten? I, do, I don't understand the question totally, but on the Wacom, what I will do is I have a certain workflow, and I know that workflow works. So what I will do is I will do skin, sharpening, tinting. That's the order. Never anything else. So when I know that the skin work is done, I will flatten my image. When I know the sharpening is done, I will flatten my image. When I, you get my drift, right? As soon as I know when something is done, I flatten my image. If I want to go back later, that's not possible. But I never work more than five minutes on a shot. So if I really mess up, I will just start over. No problem at all. Any other questions? Yes, there's a question about from Mike Janssen. Uh, what kind of gels do you use and how do they uh, stick to your reflector? Okay, the gels we use are normal gels. So you have to make sure that they're uh, not melting, but they're normal gels. So I'm just making some notes to Nadine. <laughs> and so the other questions are on uh, YouTube. Okay, there we have some other questions. Okay, um, let me see. Holy smokes, yes, we know. Uh, grits are awesome, yes, without a doubt. Um, let me see, I'm going through the Im through the stuff very quickly. Okay. Anna Week has her great things as well. You could never have a nicer and better wife, Mr. Dorov, without any doubt. Um, the interview part was awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Nadine, for doing the interview. That was great indeed. Okay, cool. Um, does Nadine have a sister in Antwerp? I don't know, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, love the interview, taste a little bit long, but word to repeat, okay, we're gonna do that. Frank, what is the difference in what you just did, putting the light higher, and what if I would normally do, put the light back a little bit up? It's not, there's no difference. What I wanted is I want a little bit more spread of the lighting. So in other words, I wanted my whole model to be lit. So that means that I actually move the light further away, meaning that I get a more spread on the light. So that's about it, that, that's all I did. So if you move it further away, I actually did the same thing. But instead of moving it further away, I actually moved it higher. So I'm still creating more distance. So that, that's the whole trick. Uh, what is the glove that Frank is wearing on his right hand? It's actually, we discussed this in the start of Digital Classroom. I dropped my camera a few weeks ago and we're now using something that's on my uh, wrist so I can't drop it anymore. And now don't think I dropped it. Somebody stand, uh, stood on my cable and actually yanked the camera out of my hands. And this is something that you learn with Tether Tools jerk stoppers that normally you have an, um, I don't know how to call it in English. We call it track on blasting. It's actually that you don't have tension on your wire, so you don't break your port. And sometimes, that, oh, most of the time, that works really great, and you feel like, okay, I'm standing on my cable. In this case, it didn't. I came up, and I just dropped my camera out. And that's why we're using now the hand or the wristband, because now I know for sure that that won't happen anymore. Oh, Steffi, can you maybe put one of the lights on me? So I look a little bit better, because I'm now, I see now on the camera I'm a little bit dark. So we're going to change one of the Letgo panels. Letgo are once one of our sponsors, by the way, for the lighting. So that looks a little bit better. There we go. Okay. So now I'm less dark. Uh, let me see. Even in 2017, the word awesome is the magic. Yeah, I use awesome a lot, I know. <laughs> uh, can you use these smoke machines on location as well? Yes, you can if you have power. If you don't have power, you uh, the only reason, or sorry, the only possibility you have is actually with a gas generator. And make sure if you buy a gas generator, there's several ones. You can use the simulated sinus. Don't buy those. Those actually will destroy all electronics. Don't use the almost sinus, like the real sinus ones. Get the ones that are pure sinus. Now, what is a sinus? It's actually the curve you see. And that's actually very, very important because if you use a laptop or whatever electronics and you use the blocks, so those are the old Yamahas, for example, you will literally blow up your stuff. So you have to make sure you have not a simulated sinus, but a real sinus. And you just power them up with gas and they work great. And they're relatively cheap and they do make some noise, but make a long extension cable and that's okay. Oh, by the way, on location, if it's cold, smoke machines won't work for the very simple reason they need a little bit of heat. Frank, on what millimeter do you shoot those long angle shots? I can't go more than 70. So that's my lens, 24 to 70. 
Uh, how about your smoke detectors in the studio? Do, do they go off? No. <laughs> we have a little bit of a cap that we actually put on our smoke detectors. So let me see if we can get a camera on there. So Steffi is now actually holding a camera. So let's see, go to camera one. Move it a little bit more up. There we go. So that's the cap we actually put on our smoke detectors. And in the past, we actually forgot about those caps. So we, we left them on. And then after a week, we can, hey, the cap is still on. So that's why we're now using that cord. So now we know if we see the cord, ah, there's a cap on. So that's why you actually see that weird cord hanging on. So yeah, <laughs> really cool. Okay, other questions. Let me see. Frank, love the show. Thank you so very much. We do it for you guys. So we really appreciate that you guys tell me us, tell us. Do you shoot at 2.8 at all, Frank? Most often I see you shooting at high f-stops. I love shooting on 2.8 or wide open, but I don't do it per se. In this case, I want more depth of field, so that means that I'm shooting on f8 or f11. And also when you're shooting strobes, f2.8 is really difficult with some strobes. Now, we are using the ELCs from Allengrom. Those are really great because they can go down in power a lot. And if you want to shoot on in the studio with a smaller aperture, uh, sorry, with a wide aperture, so 2.8 or 1.8, make sure you use light sources that eat light. Now, what do I mean, for example, strip lights? Strip lights really eat light. In other words, uh, like, for example, a reflector or a maxi light, they will give you a lot of output. A strip light will eat that light up, so it will give you less output. But it depends. In the studio, I want that shallow depth of field sometimes for portraits, and sometimes I don't. In this case, I didn't. So, no. Uh, let me see. What's the power of the strobe and the dimensions of the octa? The last shot we did with a 70 centimeter octa and a um, grid from Honeycomb Grids. That's the name of the company, Honeycomb Grids. They make grids very, very cheaply. Uh, not that's the wrong expression by the way they make it very good but they're very cheap so it's not cheaply it's not like it's junk it's very very good quality but they don't cost you an arm and a leg and the company is called honeycombgrids.com i believe so make sure you check them out really cool company uh, what's the power of the strobes we use in the studio a mix of 400 to uh, 1100 so we have some strobes that are actually a 1200 we also have around and we use those mostly with medium format cameras or if we want to freeze action. Okay, what about modified light like in the cinema? Why don't you use a chandelier for modified? I don't know what you mean with motivated light. I think you mean moody lighting. I would do that. I would normally use those chandeliers with the power on, but during digital classroom, we have these big LED panels. And we did a few digital classrooms where we put those LED panels off to get more darkness in the shot, but we didn't do it today. And I will tell you why. Today was literally a little bit of a stressed digital classroom. It was the first time we ever worked with two audios. So we didn't, we had set everything up and test everything and it went okay with Nadine, the interview. It's the first time ever we shot to the computer instead of the Mac. So I was always afraid that maybe something goes wrong or whatever. We literally installed the computer like two weeks ago and it took me a lot of time to get all the software running the way that I wanted. It's not the fault of Windows, but if you're on a Mac for eight or nine years like I've been, you know all the software you use, like Carbon Copy Cloner, you know this, you know that, you know for everything you do, there's a certain software package. On the PC, I had to find out which software do I like for my backups. There's no Carbon Copy Cloner, so I had to find something else. So before you find something that you really like, you're one day further. So that's why we actually, the computer was here for I think just after Christmas or just before. And it's been up and running since three, four days that I'm really satisfied with how everything works. We copied all the drives to NTFS. So we didn't have the guts to do a lot of stuff today because I was already stressed with this stuff. Let's see if everything works. And that's why we didn't want to put off the, um, the, the LED lighting to do the chandeliers. But maybe next time, no problem at all. Uh, let me see. Do you make a custom calibration file in Capture One for your camera? Uh, yes and no. I think the, the calibration files in Capture One are pretty good, so we use those. And in Lightroom, we always use the color checker passport from X-Rite to make sure that we have a proper profile because you can build a profile, but those profiles aren't compatible with Capture One. And in Capture One, I do a white balance, so that works pretty good. The other thing is, are smoke grenades an option? Yeah, they're really great, especially outside. We don't use them, but I know they work great outside, so without a doubt, use them. Okay, uh, two more questions and then we already, uh, 
we're going to do the retouching for you guys very quickly. Uh, in the beginning, you shot with a color checker. Is there a difference in color when you started using the smoke in editing, I mean? Yes and no. What, what you have to realize with the color checker, what you're actually doing is you're calibrating the light source on white balance. So you're not calibrating the light source with the color checker. This is something that a lot of people don't get. Just listen very carefully. The color checker is used to make sure that there's a profile for your camera sensor and your lens because those two create the colors that you see. The lighting itself has a color temperature. So you do that with white balance. Now that's not completely true, but in, if you want to see it black and white, that's how it works. With the color checker passport, you create a profile for your camera and lens. And with the white balance, you counteract for, let's say, if I put an Allengrom ELC on full power or the lowest setting, there's, let's say, 150 degree difference. That's what you do with your white balance. So in essence, if you create one profile for your camera and lens, that should be fine. Now, of course, because the color checker is really easy to use, you do it every time. But normally, if you create one, that's okay. Did Frank already do the shoot? Yeah, man, we did too. But you can later see Digital Classroom back because it's on YouTube and everything's saved on YouTube. And the final question, what angle degrees does your grids have? Everybody asks me that, Paul, and I don't have the faintest idea. What I always do is I order the middle one. I don't want the smallest one. I don't want the biggest one. I always order the middle one. And the degrees, at the moment, I order them. I know it. But then, like a year later, I, I really don't know. <laughs> I'm so very sorry for that. Okay, let's switch back to my main PC and, oops, come on Frank, there we go. But before that, we want to show you very quickly something about Capture One. Now you saw me using Capture One a lot and we actually made a really cool video about it. So we're going to show you that. Great shot. Hey guys, I'm Frank Doroff. I'm the writer of the best-selling book, Mastering the Model Shoot. Now, during my workshops, I get a lot of questions about people. What about raw developing? How to set my camera? Do I need Adobe RGB? Do I need, do I need sRGB? There are many questions out there. And the best thing to start with is use Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. That's where you start. But after that, if you want a little bit more quality, if you shoot a lot of tethered setups, Capture One is actually one of the best programs out there. It isn't the best in library modes. It isn't the best in map modes. That's where we still use Lightroom. But Capture One is an awesome RAW developer. Now what is a RAW developer and why is it important? Think about the old days when we had film. The choice of chemicals and the choice of film made a huge difference. The same film developed in different chemicals gave you totally different end result. The model was still the model, the landscape was still the same landscape, but you get more definition from one chemical. Or you get a little bit more detail or a little bit different colors, also depending on the process. And that actually is the same thing for the new digital sensors. A digital sensor records a raw image. There's no color space attached to a raw image, it's the raw image. You have to attach a color space yourself. This is also one of the most heard problems during, for example, social media stuff. How do I set my camera? If you shoot JPEG, choose sRGB or Adobe RGB. If you shoot RAW, it doesn't matter because the RAW file is the RAW file. There's no color profile attached. That's what you do in your RAW converter as soon as you go to JPEG or TIFF. And most workflows, of course, will be TIFF 16 bits because then you have a lot of stuff to work with and then you can use the bigger color spaces. But hey, I'm getting way ahead of the stuff. I don't want to teach you too much because this is a promo for a new video I created. Now, next to Lightroom, one of the most famous and best known RAW developers is, of course, Capture One. And Capture One has had a turbulent experience for me. It started when I shot medium format, I needed Capture One. And now when I shoot Sony and even when I shot Canon, I quickly found out that the raw developing of Capture One was awesome. But a lot of people have a lot of questions about how does it work? With Lightroom I know how everything works, but how does it work in Capture One? And that's why we created this video for you guys. It's a total walkthrough about how I set up Capture One to work with Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop because those are still my main programs. Capture One is used for raw developing and it does such an amazing job at that. So, check out the video on Capture One Raw Developing Workflow from me, Frank Doroff. And I'm sure if you have any questions about Capture One, 
They will be answered in that video. Okay, so we're back. And the thing I now want to do is just go through these images and just see which one I really like. And in this case, it's a little bit more difficult because we did a lot of those shots. So let's just see which ones are the best. And that's really hard to say because I love them all. So we started out with the color checker. And what we actually do is we'll create a custom white balance. There we go and just copy that to all the other shots. So hold the shift key, select all, and just say adjustments. Oops, no, something goes wrong guys, sorry for this. But it's outside your frame, so you're not seeing this. I'm running two monitors. And just do adjustments, and then, oops. Okay, copy and apply, there we go. Now they all have the proper white balance and they probably already work correct because we did this of course before. Okay, now let's see the images that I really like. Now I want one of these because I really love the way that she's posing here and I really like the light. It's almost like a painting. I love this one. This is really nice. Okay. And this one I don't like. It's too depressing. Okay, there we go. These, these were the ones with the smoke. Really, really like those. But I think the wide angle ones worked way better there. There we go. That's nice. I really like this. And yeah, there's too much smoke in front of her face. So later on, I'm actually going to remove some of these shots. I'm not going to do it now. That's really nice. And the reason I remove those shots is for the very simple reason that I don't want them to be taking up too much space on my uh, hard drive. I really like this one too. Let's go through it a little bit faster. And the ones where she actually turned around were very, very cool. And this one I like. This one I really like with the hands. It creates a little bit more three-dimensionality. It reminds me of the Evil Dead poster somehow. I don't know why. Because it has nothing to do with Evil Dead. But I really like this. But I think the, the wafer is a little bit too dark. Somehow I don't like these portrait modes. I'm a landscape kind of guy in shooting. Okay. Those were the images. So let's go to what I selected. And then we're going to go through them again to make sure that we actually select the images that I really like. And in this case, I like this one less than this one. Yes, that one I like more. And those are pretty similar, so I take that one out. There we go. Okay, go back to the front. There we go. If I choose between those two, I like them both. So I'm going to retouch both of them later on. And I'm going to do one while you guys are watching, and that's going to be this one. So let's go straight into Photoshop with this one. And then I think we have some really nice tips for you guys to enhance the smoke. Let me first go back to this one. Okay. Now, one of the things that is often not known by guys and by people watching, when you are on YouTube, we can create a lot of content and we're streaming this live. And that means that we have to buy internet for the very simple reason we don't have fast internet and we need at least 10 megabytes up for this and we only have like six. A point, a 0.6 by the way. We have a very, very slow upstream. Downstream is okay. 
So it costs a lot of money to get this stuff to you guys. And we are so incredibly grateful for the two companies that make this possible. It's BenQ and Rogue Expo Imaging. And both of those companies has become really, really good friends of us and they support our work without questioning it. Actually, BenQ's contract was up for, I think, another three months and they already renewed for 2017. Rogue, exactly the same. We talked with them and said, hey, BenQ already renewed and are you gonna do the same thing uh, next year? And they said, yeah, sure, of course. And that's the cool thing. We really love those companies. And that's why we also show their commercials during the digital classroom. And it gives me a little bit of time, of course, to take a breather. Now, one of the things that's really cool about some companies is that they listen to their photographers. Rogue is one of those examples. Now, I love the flash benders. And a while ago, they approached me like, Frank, what do you miss in the flash benders? I was going like, I would really like a silver inlay. And then they actually created something that's now on the market. And I want to show you that very quickly what they created because I'm incredibly proud of that. So here we go, Rogue. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorov, and today I'm very proud to introduce a new Rogue Expo Imaging product. Now, if you follow my work, you know that when I work with small flash, I love the Rogue flash benders. They're awesome, they're very easy to transport, they're really flat so they can fit on your case very easily, and you can create strip lights with grids, you can create soft boxes, you can even create a snoot, and it's all very, very easy to do. Now, the only thing is, the original surface of the flash bender is white. Now there's nothing wrong with white, it gives you beautiful, beautiful soft image quality. Even with a small surface, which you use with small flash. But I love to do a little bit more contrast in my images. So I normally use the silver inlay. Now the problem with the silver inlay, you have to carry it with you, you have to attach it to the flash bender, which makes bending a little bit more hard. So I just asked them and I said, you know guys, can you create a flash bender that has all the quality of the silver one, but a little bit softer? And it went like, yeah, of course we can do that, because it's a company that actually listens to photographers. And they created this amazing new flash bender. It's a new surface. It's a cross between white and silver, and they call it soft silver. And the cool thing is, because I helped them out with it, they actually gave it my name. So this is the Frank Dorov Signature Series Flash Bender. Now it's a great flash bender too, so that means it's lighter, you can bend it more easily, it's more stiffer in the sides, and it's still very easy to connect to your strobe. The cool thing, however, is this new surface called soft silver actually gives you the qualities of silver, meaning more light output, more contrast, but it also gives you the quality of white, meaning slightly softer light than silver. And it's only one flash bender. So I think this one, it already makes my images pop, and I'm sure it will also make your images pop. So check them out, the new flash bender too, Frank Dorov with soft silver to also make your images pop. Hey guys, Frank here with a little service announcement. You know I love to teach photography workshops, right? I love to work with groups and just talk about photography, make some great images and make magic happen. Now according to some people, when Nadine and I work together, the real magic happens. And well, I kind of agree because she's amazing and she has great styling and she's a great personality and an awesome model of course. So normally we work together a lot in our studio in Emmeloord and of course in the UK tour. Now one of the workshops that's absolutely the highlight of the year for us is the Ultimate Weekend. We actually do those twice a year. But they're normally in our studio. It's a two-day extravaganza workshop totally filled with information about business, duo shoots, outside, inside, retouching. We take you out for dinner. There's a lot going on. On February 24th and 25th, we have another Ultimate Weekend in our studio in Emmeloord, of course with Nadine and two other models, because we're also going to do duo shoots and it's two days. Now, a lot of people ask me like, okay, but you teach that workshop in Emmeloord and normally when you travel around, you only do one day workshops. 
Okay, we listened. On June 10 and 11th, we'll be in Amersham, that's close to London. And I will be there with Nadine for an ultimate weekend. Nadine is also going to join us to Photoshop World in Orlando. Now, Photoshop World, of course, is already a great show. But now that I have Nadine with me, we're going to do so much more. We're going to talk about styling. We're going to do how to pose your model. We're going to make some amazing shots on stage. And, well, she's even going to do the pre-con with me. So if you're in doubt about going to Photoshop World, I hope this will push you over because Photoshop World, in my opinion, is without a doubt the best learning experience you can have. It's three days, actually four if you count the pre-cons, that are so jam-packed with information you will go home with. Well, your mind will be blown, without any doubt. There's so much talent there. And right after Photoshop World, in a week, Nadine and I will be traveling to New York. And we're going to do a workshop there on April 30th in the studio of a good friend of us, Neil van Nieuwkerk. And that's an amazing studio because it has roof access, a really gritty area, and a really cool inside studio location. So again there a one-day workshop, but this time all about styling, posing your model, getting that amazing shot and so much more. I can teach a lot, but when you combine that with a great and creative stylist, we can do so much more. So don't miss that workshop. It's going to be absolutely awesome. And I don't know if Nadine, of course, will ever travel with us to the States again. So this might be your only chance. Of course, we're also going to be in Belgium, Germany, and a lot of other locations. So make sure you check out my site. There's a menu on the left on frankdorov.com and there you can see all the special workshops and we'll be adding those over the years. But these are the workshops I want to bring to your attention at the moment. So make sure you book one of those if you don't want to miss out on a great learning experience. Thank you so very much. See you on the road. Okay guys, and we just saw an amazing mess up in our website address. It's of course not Frank Dovrnov, but it's Frank Dorhoff, so don't worry about that. Okay, some very quick questions. Okay, so uh, Slatko Slatev, I hope I pronounce his name correct. Modified light is when you have a chandelier in shot light coming from this direction, even you use a strobe. Correct Slatov. and as I explained before, the reason we didn't do this, because we have LED panels on. So the LED panels will actually totally blow out the light of the chandeliers. So we can do that, but then we have to turn the LED panels off. And we didn't want to do that in this digital classroom. In the next one, we will probably mix something again, and then we will do it without lighting in the studio. Okay, uh, I, Claudine, you said you only keep one photo for your portfolio, but do you keep all raw files? Sometimes I go back, oh yeah, without a doubt. I will... Everything you saw now, I will delete some of the images, but most of the images I will keep on my computer and I will keep. So don't worry, I'm not deleting anything. I'm just selecting. So it's only a selection. Okay, Johan, do you always choose the best images yourself or do you sometimes convey with the models? <laughs> a model looks differently at a photo than the photographer does and it's my work. But I always like to work together with my models, but I like to steer them a little bit. So normally I will have my selection and then from that selection I will like squeeze my model into like, oh, do you like that one? Yeah, I love that one. Okay, great. That's the one that I wanted to do. I don't believe in giving your models all the shots from a shoot. Don't, don't ever do that. Okay, uh, nice job, Frank. I'm always struggling throwing images away. How do you keep your drive space nice and neat? I don't. I just copied everything to NTFS from AFS Plus, and it was, I believe, seven drives. So... I don't keep my hard drives very neat. I don't throw away a lot. I do throw away everything that's out of focus. I throw away everything I don't like. And I throw away everything that's not 100% the way I like it. But as soon as it's like 90% or 60%, I keep the images. So don't worry. <laughs> You're just like me. Okay, you mentioned using the G Master 24 to 70 E mount lens and its razor sharpness. It's a huge improvement over using the 24 to 70 A mount. Yes, I had that before. It's a huge improvement. And one of the cool things is it actually, the E-mount uses something called iFocus. And it's not an iPhone, but iFocus, where you actually press the OK button and it finds the eyes in the frame. And believe it or not, it's like magic. It works like 80% of the time. So that's really cool. Okay, uh, regarding the flashband, the silvery sounded funnier, but soft silver does the job, I guess. Yeah, you know, 
when I joke around with you guys, I can do weird stuff. I can say silvery or whatever. But if you do it on a packaging, you have to remember this product is sold worldwide with B&H, Adorama, and all the big companies sell it. And if, if I do, so, and you don't know me, and there's something on it, this is silvery, people won't take it seriously. Now, with me, there's always a lot of joking around. So people that know me will actually know that I joke around. But if you don't know it, you, you could think that it's not a professional product. And don't get me wrong, although I joke a lot, everything I do is 100% aimed at professionality. Uh, but I believe that if you make jokes, everything goes in way easier. That's what my dentist said. No, I'm just kidding. Regarding the flesh... Oh, sorry. Uh, James Parrish. Um, I have some of their products, never had a problem. I wish it was more rigid. Could be because I have heavy heads. Yeah, well... They are rigid. The thing that you have to do, and I don't have a small strobe here, but you have to put them all the way down. I see a lot of people connecting the flesh benders all the way up on the head, and then it will flip over and it will do weird stuff and it's not rigid. If you push it all the way down at the point where it actually makes that knick, I don't know if that's the correct expression, but where it bends, or when it, what, you know what I mean, right? Where it does this, and you sh shove it there, and then tighten it, the flesh head can't do anything anymore. And it's very, very tight. So it's only like a centimeter more down often. Uh, New York, I wish, I wish. Well, New York is awesome, dude. So make sure you check out one of those workshops online. Okay, let's go back to the retouching part. Uh, are, are there any questions on Facebook in a week? No. no? Okay. Now, I choose this image because I want to show you something with the smoke. Now, the first thing, of course, again, is do our skin work. So, uh, for skin, we always use image genomic portraiture. So, go to filter image genomic portraiture. They actually have an open beta for their new version. And I don't have it on the computer yet because I don't want to work with betas on a production machine. But I am going to download it. And I'm using the same settings as before. And you see that in the blues, that works a little bit less. So, let's take some samples here. There we go. So now we have a before and after. Really gives a little bit of sh a little bit more smoothness to the face. Okay, it's running the filter. And that's on a second monitor. Let me see if I can get that in the frame so you guys can see what we're doing now. Doesn't. Oh, there we go. It does allow me. This is something we still have to work out. It's the first time we use the PC during the live broadcast and sometimes something is projected on the second monitor. And on the Mac, of course, we did it so many times, so everything was already in its place. And with this, I still have to work that out. But with the Mac, we always had problems during broadcasts that often, uh, especially on the MacBooks, it was a little bit too slow. So this one is really fast. Okay, so we do it again, again uh, do the same thing again, layer mask and hide all, and we're just going to only paint in the effect on the skin here. There we go. And here. Oh, make sure that you're on the brush. It works way better. And we're going to use the same trick in a moment because I'm now painting this. And if you just joined us, there's a really cool trick, thank you Ineke, by using your backslash, and now you can actually see what you're painting, as you can see here. Uh, let's go to the X. There we go. And this is okay, no more ants. Yep, okay, press the backslash again. And we're back. Okay, layer, flatten image. Now, in this case, because we used very aggressive side lighting, you can see that we have a little bit more roughness in the skin here. We just used the clone tool, or sorry, the healing brush. We're just going to paint that out very quickly. And don't worry, you don't have to make your models look like a Barbie doll. And just make it a little bit more smooth. Now, do remember, when you convert this to the internet versions, it will look like she looks like a Barbie doll, but you will see that there's a lot of difference between overdoing it and converting it to internet and doing it the way that I do it now and converting it to the internet. It just looks a little bit more clean, but not too clean, if you know what I mean. Okay, there we go. Good enough. 
Okay, now for the background. Now you saw me using in the previous one, you saw me using Topaz Clarity. Now there's another one that I really, really like for smoke, and that's actually Topaz Detail. So go into Filters, Topaz, and go into Detail. Now for the Topaz, we actually have a really cool discount on our website. If you go to our website on frankdoorhoff.com, there we go. Uh, we have on our website, we have a special page called discounts and on the discounts you actually get a lot of the stuff for a lot less so that's pretty cool i think because it saves you money and hey we're dutch we love saving money okay so this is detail so what i'm going to do is i have some presets here called pop as you can see it really pops the smoke it gives it way more detail now also here don't overdo this just do it a little bit there we go so we have the original and the sharpened one. Now I hope you can see this on YouTube because I don't know how much YouTube compresses, but normally yes. Okay, somebody tells me that my save is super sharp in the image and I'm less sharp. I'm so very sorry for that, Harry, if somebody told me before I could have changed the camera. So we will make notice of that and it won't happen again. Johan, how do you select the skin tones in portraiture? Normally holding the old key would do the job, but in portraiture that doesn't seem to work with me. Correct. In portraiture you have to use the picker with the plus, and then you can use more. Okay, let's see. Before and after. I really love it everywhere except on the skin. So we're going to do this, and I'm not done yet, so don't go yet, because we have some really cool tips for this. We do a reveal all. We're going to take it out of the skin. But I want to keep it in the mask. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it first very rough. There we go. I'm going to use that backslash. Oops. First going to do it really rough. And then... There we go. Then we're going to zoom in to 100%. If my computer agrees with me. There we go. And on the mask, I actually want to take it away. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lower the size of my brush, press the X key again, and just paint the effect out of the mask because I really like that sharpness on everything that the mask has. And again, you can do this pretty rough. On the eyes, it's okay. I'm going to see that somebody changes that camera for the final part, that it's straight at me, that we won't have to save uh, in focus, and not me. Mm -mm. That camera, in a week, you have to point it at me instead of at the save. This is something that can happen, guys, during a live broadcast. Sometimes we don't see if it's 100% sharp. Okay, this looks pretty good. Let's change that back. There we go. And now you can see that it really makes a difference. But I want that smoke a little bit more enhanced. So let's go with that. And the first thing, of course, I do, and again, it's my way. I always do flat an image because I like to work with one layer and just add it up. I'm going to go back to Topaz Labs, but now I'm not going to use detail, I'm going to use clarity. And clarity I'm going to use very focused on that part of the smoke only. So let me give it a little bit more pop on the smoke. And just overdo it a little bit. There we go. See the original and the final. Okay, now what you can do is here inside, in clarity, you can actually change your micro contrast and low contrast. Just pump that up a little bit, the low contrast. And do the same thing for medium contrast. There we go. High contrast, I don't know yet. Let me see what the effect is. No, I don't like that, so take that down. And that will give more structure to the smoke. And smoke is something a lot of people ask me, like, how do you get the smoke the way that you do? Is by just playing with these four settings. Because that really, really makes the smoke pop. And of course, you can also change hue and saturation, but I don't want to do that now. Let's press OK. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see that these are pretty heavy filters. And this is one of the reasons I actually changed to the PC because I wanted a little bit more speed. And with the Mac Pro, you really have to pay a lot of money to get just a little bit of speed bump. So I thought, why not try the PC and save a lot of money? Okay, so we now did a layer mask and uh, hit everything. So I'm going to take a big brush and just go on a very slowly just paint the effect in of the smoke. There we go. And I like it on the lamps also, on the chandeliers. Not too much, just a little bit. There we go. Clarity can be awesome, but it can also totally destroy a shot, so be careful. I like this. I like this a lot. Yes, this is cool. I like it on the fabric here. Maybe on the legs a little bit. No, not too much. So press the X key again and you can take it out. Now, a lot of people will use the eraser. Don't ever do that because with the eraser, and you are destroying something and you can't get back. And with this masking, you can actually paint in the opposite color and you can get everything back again. So this, this is really nice. Okay, now the pearl on her head, I want it a little bit brighter. So I'm going to use that same trick you saw before using the dots tool. And just, there we go. Not too much, I don't want to overdo it, but this is okay. There we go, that is actually a little bit too much for me. So let's go back. back. Sometimes it helps to zoom in and sometimes you just have to do it from this angle. There we go, this is nicer. Very nice, okay. And let's go into filter alien skin and do the exposure. Also for exposure, by the way, we have a lot of stuff that you can download like filters and uh, our own presets. And I'm not using the presets at the moment. We still have to install them in this. Like I told you, the, the PC was literally done just before Digital Classroom. So if you go here, frankdorofcom slash presets, you can actually download all the looks I do. And we have them for a lot of programs, including Mac Fun, DxO, uh, Alien Skin Exposure, what's or not. And they're, a, they're priced at 10 euros, so I think pretty cheap. Okay. Actually love this look because it's the same look we, look, we used before. The only thing is I want to enhance that blue a little bit more. And that's the cool thing, you can do whatever you want. Just go into color, oops, sorry, and go into the blues. And just bump those up. There we go. Now look at the difference, before and after. Really like this, gives it a really nice, almost atmospheric look. Now make sure that it's not doing something weird here. So let's take out the greens a little bit. And I think the problem is in the blues, actually. There we go, that's much better. And just bump cyan. Really like this. Before, after, nice. And press apply. And we're done with this shot. Now I'm going to retouch the other shots tonight. And we're going to upload those to social media, of course, for you guys. And uh, let me see, Anavik, are there any more questions? No, no questions on Facebook. No questions on Facebook, so I'm going to check my social, uh, social media stream on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to switch back to that one. Okay, so do we have any questions then? I hope I'm now sharp and not the safe, because I'm more important than the safe, of course, although in the safe is all our expensive stuff. Okay, let me see, no more questions here. That's great. Okay, if you like this, guys, please make sure to check out our sponsors, of course, and also my book, because I wrote Mastering the Model Shoot, and this is actually the Chinese version. So if you're in China, you can get it. Now, if you're like English, you can get it also in English, and there's also a Czech version, and there should also be a uh, simplified Chinese version, but... You see that the covers are different? That's so cool. So we don't have the other one. So if you find, or if you're living in China and you have the other one, that should be one with a white cover, let me know. And we'll pay for shipping, of course, but we really like that book. So we really would like to have that. And we do have anything more to announce because there will be a new digital classroom when? February uh, 8th. February 8th, there will be a new digital classroom. And who's the model? It's 
It's going to be Lois. Oh, Lois. That's our new model. She's stunning. She's amazing. She's crazy. She's awesome. She is without a doubt a reason to tune in. Of course, digital classroom is always cool. And of course, for March, for all you Dutch people, go to professionalimaging.nl and get your tickets. There's still an early bird till uh, uh, January 31st. And I'm going to tell you now already, you will not regret this because it's an amazing experience. It's really, really cool. And for everybody else, I would like to thank you so very much. Let me see if I forgot something. Oh, yeah, of course. This is the final part, and I'm going to let you go. If you like what we do, we really need your help. We want to do even more. We want to do more broadcasts of Digital Classroom. Join us on Patreon. Patreon is like a big uh, tip bar. So you can vouch for $1 a month, or you can vouch for $10 a month, or $25. And what you get back is you make sure that we can do what we do best, give you guys education and free stuff. And, of course, also on social media we do a lot. The other thing is you get access to a closed off Facebook group where we can discuss stuff, where you can show your images and you get a one or two or ten image portfolio review every month. But there's way more. Just check it out on Patreon and trust me, you really help us. The other way you can really help us and it don't cost you anything is subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Let people know about the channel. Spread the word about the channel because if we grow that channel, we can get more people interested and we get more interest from sponsors. And that's what makes this all possible. We don't earn any money from it. So make sure that we earn money by bringing us sponsors, by joining our channel. Thank you so very much for watching, guys. It was a blast. I really loved having Nadine here and doing the interview. New digital classrooms will be different. We're going to experiment with a lot of different stuff during 2017 because we always want to do stuff differently. And from my side, I just want to help. thank you so very much for watching and making this all possible. Thanks to BenQ and Roke and, of course, to you guys. Thank you so very much, guys, and see you next time.